Hello. In this episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing chest pain, specifically how to approach acute chest pain that occurs in a patient already admitted to the hospital, what might trigger a rapid response code. Imagine that as an intern or resident, you're sitting in noon conference, trying to absorb a little learning while chewing down your lunch, and you receive this text page. Amy, calling regarding patient Ms. Ramirez, 8 out of 10 substernal chest pain start at 5 minutes ago, heart rate 100, blood pressure 150 over 80, O2 sat 98% on 2 liters, bedside eval, requested ASAP. As you stuffed the wrapped remains of your sandwich into your white coat pocket and hurry across the hospital, you'll be thinking about all the possible diagnoses that Ms. Ramirez may be experiencing. Now, the full list of causes of chest pain is pretty long, but luckily we can narrow it down quite a bit as whatever is happening to her must have been something that had developed very quickly and something which has a tendency to strike people in the hospital. Let's take a look at the subset of etiologies that satisfy those criteria. Among cardiovascular causes, there is acute coronary syndrome, tachyarrhythmias and hypertensive emergency, both of which can lead to chest pain via demand ischemia. There's Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, also known as stress-induced cardiomyopathy, which is transient regional myocardial dysfunction in the absence of coronary artery disease that's triggered by intense physiologic or emotional stress, and pericarditis, which, when occurring in an already hospitalized patient, is usually due to uremia, post-cardiac surgery, or as a post-MI phenomenon. Among pulmonary causes are pulmonary embolism and iatrogenic pneumothorax following a procedure like a thoracentesis or a central line insertion. GI causes include esophagitis, GERD, and gastritis. And last, there is the possibility of a panic attack or other form of anxiety. This is not a trivial list, but it is more focused than the full diagnostic framework for chest pain that I showed a minute ago. In my experience as an adult hospitalist, the most common cause of acute chest pain among already hospitalized patients has been a tachyarrhythmia. So now that you've been reminding yourself of all these etiologies while you're en route to Ms. Ramirez's room, you arrive and now you need to conduct a highly focused history and physical exam. If she's a patient of your, of your own, you likely already know the answers to the key historical questions. For example, does she have classic cardiovascular risk factors? Does she have a history of prior tachyarrhythmia, such as paroxysmal AFib, which would obviously make that one of the more likely causes here? Has she had an intrathoracic procedure within the uh, past day, including thoracentesis, central line, or pacemaker placement? Has she had cardiac surgery within the last several weeks, which would place her at risk of pericarditis? Is she post-orthopedic surgery, particularly hip or knee, or does she have a history of malignancy, both of which place her at a higher risk of a PE? And the one key question which you'll need to ask her right there and then is whether the pain is pleuritic in nature, meaning that is it worse with deep breathing or coughing? While pleuritic pain makes most internists immediately think of PE, pneumothorax and pericarditis also lead to the same. Regarding the highly focused exam, tachycardia obviously points to a tachyarrhythmia as being the primary cause. Hypotension can be seen in acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, PE, or pneumothorax. Hypoxemia combined with a normal lung exam strongly suggests a PE. Elevated JVP points towards either ACS or PE. Bilateral crackles suggest a primary cardiovascular problem rather than a lung process, while an asymmetric lung exam suggests a pneumothorax. A pericardial friction rub obviously points towards pericarditis, but the friction rub is uncommon and often fleeting. And last, signs of a deep vein thrombosis in the leg suggest PE. You may notice that there aren't any specific features on exam or on history that really point towards a GI etiology or an anxiety, and in the hyperacute setting, there really isn't. The focus is more on ruling out life-threatening cardiac and pulmonary problems, and once they've been ruled out, then you could do a deeper dive on the, uh, to separate out the other possibilities. Hopefully, from the focused history and a few minutes of exam, you're already able to narrow down the differential diagnosis a bit, and it's time for some diagnostics. 
As with respiratory distress, POCUS or point of care ultrasound can be very helpful in acute chest pain, but only if performed quickly by someone experienced. Some potential findings include acutely decreased contractility, suggesting ACS, a lack of lung sliding, suggesting pneumothorax, a dilated right ventricle and flattening of the interventricular septum, suggesting a pulmonary embolism, and a pericardial effusion, suggesting pericarditis. When dealing with an acute crisis at the bedside, you need to consider how to prioritize diagnostic tests when there is a limited number of hands available and limited physical space around the patient. If you suspect a cardiovascular etiology or pulmonary embolism, start with an ECG and ultrasound. Whereas if you suspect a pneumothorax, start with an ultrasound and a chest x-ray. Labs, meaning blood tests, are generally not helpful in the evaluation of hyperacute chest pain. Among the 11 etiologies that should be considered that I listed, troponin may be elevated in a handful, but even for high-sensitivity troponin assays, some time is needed to first elapse, an hour give or take, before an increase is observed. The only reason to get a troponin at the onset of the pain is for a, pay, uh, for a baseline, to which a later value can be compared, which is not as time-sensitive as the other diagnostics I've listed. Let's talk about empiric treatment. What should you start doing for the patient as soon as you start getting some data? Give them oxygen if they're hypoxemic. Consider sublingual nitroglycerin if the patient is not hypotensive and if they're adequately volume replete. Giving nitro to a hypovolemic patient can trigger pronounced hypotension. Consider IV metoprolol if the patient is in sinus tach, is not hypotensive, and demand ischemia is suspected. This does not mean to give metoprolol to everybody, but if you think that the tachycardia is increasing myocardial oxygen demand beyond what the coronaries are able to provide due to pre-existing stable coronary disease, metoprolol might improve the patient's symptoms. Aspirin if acute coronary syndrome is suspected. And consider antacids or a GI cocktail if one of the GI etiologies is suspected. What's included in the GI cocktail varies a little between institutions, but it often contains a combination of an antacid to neutralize stomach acid, viscous lidocaine to provide topical anesthesia, and an anticholinergic to reduce stomach cramping. I'll finish with some common pitfalls when responding to acute chest pain in the hospital. Focusing on the initial troponin when it won't reflect the acute event. Using POCUS to make diagnoses that exceed one's skill set. Echocardiography is a challenging skill. Cardiology fellows complete months of dedicated, supervised practice before they become reasonably competent in some of the more nuanced findings. If you're a medical resident or intern, it's unlikely you have sufficient experience and training to call things like specific wall motion abnormalities, giving very specific numerical estimates of the ejection fraction, or calling something like McConnell sign in suspected PE. Using pain relief with nitroglycerin as a diagnostic test. There are studies showing that pain relief with nitroglycerin among ER patients actually lowers the probability that pain was from a myocardial infarction. This does not mean that you shouldn't try it because at the very least it might make the patient feel better, but the probability that a patient has ACS is not diminished just because nitro has no effect on their pain. And last, don't overemphasize the impact of VTE prophylaxis on the probability the patient has a PE. While VTE prophylaxis does lower the probability that a hospitalized patient with chest pain has a PE, it's not a profound difference. Particularly in settings in which the majority of patients are on prophylaxis, the majority of patients who develop PEs in the hospital will have been on prophylaxis at the time. That concludes this video on responding to acute chest pain in the hospital. If you found this helpful, be sure to check out the rest of the Intern Crash Course series.